Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to our webinar series on recovery and resiliency on Main Street. I'm Patrick McMahon, CEO of the Connecticut Main Street Center. Connecticut Main Street Center is the expert resource for developing and sustaining vibrant downtowns that fuel our state's prosperity. Our mission is to assess, educate, convene, and advocate to develop and grow our traditional downtowns, village centers, and urban mixed-use neighborhoods. Given the impact of and challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, our theme for our programming this year is recovery and resiliency on Main Street. A few housekeeping uh, items. Today's session will run approximately one hour. Please feel free to type in your questions in the chat function as we go. We will monitor the chat box and have our panelists address questions when we pause for questions and answers. We'd ask that you also include in the chat box answers to these questions. Are there policy issues related to downtowns that you would like to see addressed by the legislature? And what are some key funding programs related to downtowns that you would like to see continued or increased? A recording of today's session will be available on our website at ctmainstreet.org as are all of our workshops archives. You will receive a brief evaluation in the next day or so. We greatly appreciate your input so that we can continually improve these sessions. Also, evaluations are required for the town planners for AICP CM credits. We are grateful to our sponsors, our educational programs, Main Street Forms for the 21st Century, are sponsored by Webster Bank, Avant Grid, and the Farmington Bank Community Foundation. Our corporate investors are People's United Bank, Capital for Change, Windsor Federal, and M&T Bank. Connecticut Main Street Center's founding sponsors are Eversource and the Department of Economic and Community Development, and our growth partners are Avant Grid and the State Historic Preservation Office. Connecticut Main Street Center also has important strategic partnerships, including our new partnership with the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, for which Connecticut Main Street Center provides educational programs that qualify for the Certified Connecticut Municipal Official Program. And our AICP certification maintenance provider is FHI Studio. Today's webinar is being sponsored by Express Strategies, and Fuss O'Neill Engineering. Express Strategies is a strategic communications and public policy consulting business. We thank Bernard Cavalier, past Connecticut Main Street Center board member and managing principal of Express Strategies for supporting this program. I'd also like to recognize Fuss and O'Neill for their participation. I'd like to introduce Kathy Nanowski, Vice President and Director of Marketing and Business Development at Fuss and O'Neill, who also serves on the Connecticut Main Street Center Board of Directors, who will say a few words of welcome. Kathy? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. As Patrick mentioned, I'm the Director of Marketing for Fuss and O'Neill and a very proud member of the Board of Directors for Connecticut Main Street. Fuss and O'Neill started out in Connecticut back in 1924 foundation to our design work is enhancing downtowns while maintaining their brand. I'm a marketer, so I know how important brand is. From the Beehive Bridge in New Britain, my hometown, to the Montgomery Mills Adaptive Reuse Development in downtown Windsor Locks. I personally benefit from these projects because I live here, visit many of your downtowns. Downtowns are where my girls go to see Santa, we attend a parade, or Soon, we'll be participating in a local uh, business scavenger hunt, which will be fun. Our firm has been supporting Connecticut Main Street for over 15 years. I joined the board because Connecticut Main Street's mission is to keep the brand of our downtowns true to our New England roots, while providing the resources that support the future. I'm really excited for today's program because I got to see the Main Street Working Group in action. I can't wait to, for everybody here to uh, to hear all about it. 
group was established last year to help educate legislators on issues related to downtown revitalization and advocate for downtown friendly policies and programs. These policies will help make your downtown safer, hopefully bringing some needed funding and support. Thanks again uh, to our presenters today. I can't wait for you to hear what's coming up. Thank you so much, Kathy. Really appreciate the support of Fuss and O'Neill and your presence on our board of directors. It's not, sorry, the slide is not progressing. Technology. Try going backwards, Patrick. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that glitch. So it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce the working group co-chairs. Representative Quentin Phipps is former executive director of the Middletown Downtown Business District. As director for the DBD, he launched Middletown's first Middletown Restaurant Week. We also have with us Representative Jane Garibay, who is the former executive director of First Town Downtown, Windsor's nonprofit Main Street program. And she also had served as the former executive director of the Windsor Chamber of Commerce. So she understands the needs of small businesses. We also have with us Representative Jennifer Leeper, who enjoys downtown Fairfield and understands the essential role downtowns have for the vitality of our communities. Thank you for joining us today. We're now going to have each of the working group co-chairs speak about their downtowns and what has compelled them to establish this working group and to participate in it. Representative Phipps. So good morning, everyone. And, and Patrick, thank you once again for your, your hard work and your assistance and support in these efforts. We could not do it without you. And my headphones are working, correct? Yes. Okay, we're good to go. Um, so yeah, so I want to say no, no, thank you once again for that introduction and to uh, our co-chairs for, for this work. I said it's, this is really integral for the growth of our state um, and where we're going. When we think about what COVID um, relief will look like and what the response will be, um, it's really going to be about support of our independent business owners, um, the vibrancy of not just our metropolitan areas and our rural areas, um, but really the, the central and the small uh, cities, the big towns that many of us consider our favorite places to eat, shop, and work. So really, really glad to be here with everyone. And um, I think this picture really says a lot about not just uh, the district that I represent, the 100th district, um, but what's gonna a lot of the favorite things that we think of when we think of uh, Middletown, right? That iconic uh, Aragoni Bridge, um, a model is a toy store that has been there for uh, literal generations, the beautiful riverfront. Um, once again, these are the unique things that our seniors and elders, um, our millennials and young professionals, and everyone, um, this is where we're, we run shows and live, work, and play. So just really, really glad to be here with everyone and looking forward to the uh, rest of the part of the conversation. Thank you, Representative Phipps. Now to uh, Representative Garibay, who actually has two distinct downtowns that uh, she serves in her district, Windsor, uh, first, and then we'll go to Windsor Locks. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you, Patrick, for that introduction. Um, yes, I have two towns in my district and they're both on Route 159, both their main streets. Um, Windsor has an incredible town green restaurant. We've been working on transit-oriented development and complete street projects for Route 159. Um, Windsor was subject years ago when they changed things to move traffic faster through the centers of town and the street was reconstructed, which now we know is kind of an issue. More streets does not make um, for better traffic. Um, and then in Windsor Locks, they were right before the urban renewal. And I'm kind of mixing them together, Patrick, um, with urban renewal. And if you saw the pictures of, it was like a year before her stark building started to be the in thing, their whole main street was just like bulldozed down and you just see the heat. And the other issue was they didn't have a plan to move forward at that time. Um, the Montgomery 
mill renovation, which Patrick had a huge part in, um, to me is a building of success. It took an old mill building, it's beautiful, um, made it into apartments, and 60% of them are um, affordable housing. Um, and it's just been an incredible success. Both towns have been working on transit-oriented development. Windsor has gotten back the double rail. Um, we have a small train station. Um, Windsor Locks is poised, has um, been designated the funds to be able to do a big train station. Um, we're working on Complete Streets project in both. Um, they just received in Windsor Locks a grant um, for um, its old train station um, and through fundraising um, efforts. In Windsor, um, we, we have the double train, we have condos right in the center of town. We have 100 and I think it's 63 apartments in the center of town. Um, the Chamber of Commerce First Town with the town of Windsor has worked to bring up all our restaurants to make them stronger, to bring them into the 20th century or 21st century with um, having their menus accessible through iPhones, et cetera, just things that you wouldn't normally think about to make it more customer friendly. Um, and that is why when one day on my first session, Q Phipps was walking by me and we go, oh, you were a Main Street director or you are a Main Street director. And you could just, talking, we just felt the passion that we had to do something because um, we live it, we eat it. I sometimes feel our small towns after living in Mexico City for nine years where they do have transit oriented development, they do have mixed use. I never had a car, you could, you know, you had subway, you had train, you had buses. Um, and I see our little centers on a much smaller scale, obviously, but having that for people so that you can take the train, you can take the bus, walkability, safety, et cetera. Um, and one of the most crucial pieces is that people are working together, that the main street is working with the towns um, that these um, that they're in, working with your state reps because that's how you can get things done on the state level. And most importantly, being a first town director, working with the Connecticut Main Street program, um, if it hadn't been for the Connecticut Main Street, to have that guidance and education, it's the only place you can go to um, besides the internet, but for real help. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jane. And next up, we have Representative uh, Leeper, who will talk about Fairfield and how uh, Representative Garibay and uh, Phipps recruited you to be a co-chair. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, none of this work would be possible without you. You're such an effective and compelling advocate for our main streets. And um, so I'm Rep State Representative Jennifer Leeper from Fairfield and Southport. And while my background isn't in Main Street preservation and development like my colleagues, I am a New England girl at heart and I just have a deep appreciation for the colonial architecture and the historical charm of our communities and our town centers and main streets are central to that. When my husband and I were moving from New York City to Connecticut, our realtor told us drive up Route 1 to get a sense of the towns and when we hit Fairfield we knew we found home. We ended up buying a home and renovating it in our Main Street district because we loved the proximity to our restaurants and our arts venues like the Fairfield Theater Company. And now we're so lucky to have a newly renovated uh, community theater, which was a successful partnership with our um, Sacred Heart University here in Fairfield. And we also are lucky to have Fairfield University, which is another uh, fantastic town partner, uh, but we also love to uh, be able to walk to our, weekly's far our weekly farmer's market on our town green and just generally the walkability to grab a cup of coffee, pick up something from our local grocery store and our train station. It's a lot of what we had loved about living in a city, but here in a small and beautiful suburban community. Uh, 
I knew I had to be a part of this working group when I heard about it because I literally live in our main streets. And so when Q mentioned it to me, uh, I said, I have to be a part of this. Um, investing in and preserving and effectively planning for the restoration and development of our main streets is at the heart of our communities. No other region in the country has the uniqueness in their small towns that we have here in New England. I love the idea of breathing new life into our historic downtowns that might need it so that they can again be spaces where people want to gather. And lastly, I'll add that supporting our downtowns is good for our local economies. We know that two thirds of every dollar spent locally stays in our communities. Main streets support local entrepreneurs and specifically in here, here in Fairfield, our main street is home to dozens of women owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So all this to say, when we invest in our main streets, our entire community benef benefits. Thank you, Representative Leeper. And we are just thrilled that you are one of the co-chairs. You bring so much uh, energy and you also represent another portion of the state. And so we uh, like that to get the additional perspectives and the work that we do. So, so thank you very much. All right, I'm now gonna turn it to uh, Representative uh, Phipps who will lead us on uh, what is the working group and what are its goals? So that's a good question. And I think uh, Representative Gary Airbnb and Representative Leeper really talked about really what's at the core of this working group. Yes. Um, and that's really love and it's passion and it's a joy um, for these particular areas, right? I mean, I think you've seen all of us talk about um, where we live and, or where we've worked and you see the smile, right? You see the, the, the happiness, you see the excitement um, about what we've been able to produce together, what we've been, what places we've been able to learn, all the experiences and over sharing a meal or going to a play at the theater, so on and so forth. At the core of this um, group and this working group is really about um, is it the joy and excitement, right? The things that um, really make New England uh, iconic and unique and some of the sort of like I would, we would all say are hidden uh, gems in our areas in the state of Connecticut and why folks want to as a visit on whether as a tourist um, or uh, make uh, Connecticut their home. It's really about these areas. And I said, if you um, are at any of our meetings and groups, it, you can usually see that smile that um, brightens up the room. And we have it in uh, three said, core ways, right? And those that I'm just gonna read them because I think it's really important to um, talk about that. First is edu um, educate. Um, so educate our legislators um, and also all of our other stakeholders, right? So we've had partnerships um, and um, visitors to our meetings, whether it's from the administration, uh, whether it's other advocacy groups, um, I said our fellow legislators. And I will um, uh, point out that this is a nonpartisan group, right? Um, we have Democrats, we have Republicans, uh, working families, independent, we have everyone. Uh, this is not about partisan, uh, where you want to live, work and play and thrive is not a partisan issue. Um, so the support of our, our small businesses and independent owners um, was gonna, it's not a partisan issue. This is really an issue about making Connecticut um, awesome. So it is a nonpartisan group and it starts with education, making sure that we have a um, language and an understanding and a data set that we can all move forward on as we try to create solutions in strengthening um, our downtown and Main Street areas. So the first is education. And if you have not been able to uh, join us for one of these uh, webinars or uh, thinking groups, um, discussions, I would heavily, heavily encourage you to do so because the discussions have been quite dynamic. And oftentimes folks are like, oh, I've got to go back to my mayor, go back to my first selectman and bring that information to them um, because it's things that you can use um, right away to bringing dollars back into your um, home district. Um, two is the, uh, pursuing downtown and friendly policies and programs. And I will say once again, what's good for downtown and what's good for uh, main streets are often good for the entire state. Um, so we have um, done charrettes, we've um, did brainstorming. Uh, we've done a, quite a few ways in trying to figure out uh, great policy for these areas. Um, and the last part um, was going to say support of a, sh a strong statewide uh, Main Street program. Um, and that's what's supposed to get on the, the micro level, which is the organization itself, um, but also on the macro level that when you think about your uh, uh, small cities and large towns, um, Windsor, Middletown, Fairfield, uh, Torrington, uh, New London, the list goes on and on, uh, Willimantic, Stores, this goes on and on. Um, a lot of the areas that we love the most in Connecticut are these particular areas. So if we have 
um, strong central districts, then we will have a strong Connecticut. So uh, these are all really, really important goals as part of what we are doing. And I do once again. Can, can you, uh, can you speak on the, the different uh, topics that we've uh, brought before yep. the, the working group? Yeah, so I also want to make, make sure we mention those specifically. So we've had um, DOT talk about uh, transit-oriented development. Uh, DCD has come speaking about specific support um, for business programs. This was even before um, PP and the COVID relief. Uh, we've had uh, Professor uh, Sarah Bronin of uh, Desegregate Connecticut. They've come and talk about um, housing in these areas. Uh, Kylie Goslin and Kevin Turner was getting uh, uh, brilliant strategists around housing. Uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Bicewitz did a, a great presentation about uh, supporting small business during the pandemic. Um, and then CT Main Street Center was gonna provide an overall overview of things that we should all be doing in our downtown areas. And so those uh, folks on this uh, on the Zoom session should encourage their legislators to contact the co-chairs about participation. Please, once again, we are always still taking members. Membership is widely open. Um, and I said, it's really open for everyone. I think every, uh, many towns have a, a central district or a downtown or a main street district. Please send them over. Um, we meet fairly regularly, uh, but it's a good way and a free way of uh, networking and making great policy. Thank you, Representative Phipps. Uh, Representative Leeper, can you speak a little bit more about uh, the goal of pursuing downtown friendly policies and programs? Yeah, absolutely. So as a working group, we can initiate legislation that would be intru introduced through one of the General Assembly committees, um, which committee would depend upon the bill subject matter, but all three of us co-chairs serve on the Commerce Committee and Commerce by and large oversees small businesses. So it's very closely related to the work of, of Main Streets and, and fueling uh, our small local businesses success. Uh, this session, we did propose legislation. The first was to allow for continued zoning flexibility to assist restaurants with outdoor dining as they recover from the pandemic. And we had heard uh, from countless restaurant owners that this flexibility during the pandemic had been a life-saving um, policy for them. And they asked that we could extend it another year. And I think it passed uh, the house unanimously. I think we all were the beneficiaries of, of more El Fresco dining at a time where we were otherwise extremely homebound and, and isolated. So it really was a win-win policy that I know we all were, were thrilled to champion. Um, and then the language was adapted uh, as um, an amendment to a bill raised in the Planning Development Committee because Planning and Development had their bill going onto the floor sooner and we wanted this to go live as soon as possible. And yet, like I said, it passed both House and Senate and the governor signed it into law. And um, at Connecticut Main Street's center suggestion, we're seeking a multi-agency task force to study the impediments to restoration of historic mixed use properties and whether the state should initiate educational programming for small scale developers so that we can get more people doing the work to restore historic Main Street buildings. Thank you, Representative Leeper. Uh, Representative Garibay, can you speak to the third point of supporting a strong statewide Main Street program? Jane, you're on mute. Jane. Sorry about that. Our downtown village centers and neighborhood commercial districts are so important to the state's economy and the quality of life of our local communities. Having strong statewide Main Street coordinating program like CT Main Street Center to assist local communities through high quality educational programming and technical assistance is crucial. I know firsthand as former um, Executive Director of First Town Downtown, the hard work that goes into supporting small businesses, developing programs and events to draw people downtown and facilitating special projects that will add value to the Main Street. Connecticut Main Street Center helps communities learn about the best practices 
and the resources available to move projects forward. The working group is supporting Connecticut Main Street Center's request for a $350,000 state budget line item to increase staff capacity so they can meet the needs of Connecticut's many downtowns and village centers. And it's really a small amount of money for the yeoman's work that Connecticut Main Street does. And I just have to put in a plug. One thing that I would love would be speed bumps through town centers. And I know um, town manager Peter Sousa is shaking his head no, um, but just have to add that would slow down traffic. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Garibay. And thank you for the support of Connecticut Main Street Center and all the great work that you've done in uh, downtown Windsor. We thank you. Uh, we're gonna stop the slideshow right there for right now and have you uh, answer a few questions. Uh, this is called the, a Main Street Working Group and, and not a, a caucus. Is there, what, what's the distinction? I can answer that. Um, so I was gonna, I mean, while, while this is a, a legislative group, um, a caucus typically implies um, a lot more about politics, right? But this isn't about politics. I think this is really about what's, it's about work, it's about education, um, and it's about driving results into I said, some very diverse economic areas um, that need additional support and empowerment. Okay. Uh, how is uh, the agenda of the working group uh, prepared? The co-chairs get together and determine what uh, what you're gonna be working on? How's that, how's that formulated? Right, we do, we do meet and um, we talk about what we see and what we hear. We do have a membership um, that talk, you know, give us ideas about what they would like to see. We talk with you, Patrick, what's happening out there? What do we need to do? Um, and so then with the three of us, we put an agenda together. Uh, what's the extent of the working group's power or authority? Jen, do you wanna take that? I think that we get to serve as um, effective liaisons from our community. One of the other things I would say to help get something on an agenda is in consultation with our local, um, either directors for economic development or chambers of commerce, or just our local business owners who, who see a challenge that maybe we could help address. Um, and we get to serve as liaisons for those local issues to to the legislature where hopefully we can help solve them. Um, I think that's the extent of our power uh, is being effective in that in that way. So piggybacking on that, if uh, someone wanted to get the working group uh, support of an initiative, how would they go about that? That's a great question. I think they could contact us directly. They could mm -hmm. also contact their legislator and um, ask their legislator to join our working group or to liaise with us. Um, and we're pretty accessible. And, and it might be helpful if the three of us put our emails in the chat after this so everyone knows exactly how you can reach us. Um, I don't know if, I, if there's uh, something I've missed, Rep Phipps or Rep <laughs> Garibay. And I'll just add really quickly, I think, especially because of Representative Gary and I's background um, and being downtown directors is that we are only as strong um, as our stakeholders, right? So in this case, our constituents, uh, the other uh, advocacy folks, um, anyone that also cares about these issues, uh, when you speak up, when you send your emails, when you make your calls, um, when you reach out to your legislature to your legislators to bring them to our group so our numbers expand, um, that's what makes us stronger. It's really not about the three of us. Um, it's really about us as a collective. And I think that is one of the things um, that once again is really at the heart of our work. Right, there's power in numbers, just in numbers. You know, if one person says something, you know, people can just blow you off, whatever. But when you have numbers in the restaurant um, group, um, was really effective in that and that we received many emails from the restaurants in our three districts, et cetera. So we knew that was an issue that we wanted to work on. Thank you. We uh, next wanted to go into some of the bills that are being discussed during this legislative session. And let me pull that up. Can everybody see that? Are we good? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Uh, at Connecticut Matry Center, we believe there are six core components of a healthy downtown. Uh, place, economic vitality, stewardship, inclusiveness, sustainability, and connectivity. Uh, we've been tracking legislation that falls under one of these uh, six categories, so supporting some of them and, or others that we're just uh, tracking. Uh, the first one is under economic uh, vitality. We want to uh, see policies that grow tools and resources for small businesses. Uh, DECD has a, uh, has a requested bill before the legislature to uh, make changes to its small business express program, uh, House Bill 6467. Uh, as many people on the Zoom would know, uh, the small business express program provided uh, grants and loans that were administered through DECD utilizing DECD staff. Uh, what the, the change of the program would be is that it would create a, a, a create or leverage an existing uh, loan guarantee program uh, so that the work would be done by an uh, outside uh, entity, but still uh, result in the same impacts for small business development. And it would also uh, help fund some of the revolving loan programs uh, across the state so that uh, those who have a more difficult time uh, getting traditional bank financing would have that uh, opportunity. Uh, there's another bill in front of the Commerce Committee to uh, establish a grant program for women and minority-owned businesses. Uh, it did uh, get voted out of uh, committee, uh, so we'll see where, where that uh, ends up going. Uh, outside dining, we've already uh, heard from a couple of the representatives how key the restaurant trade is for our downtowns. Uh, thankfully, uh, legislation has been passed uh, to extend uh, the flexibility uh, under the essentially the executive orders that have been in place uh, to date, uh, and that'll extend to March 31st, 2022, and it's already been signed into uh, law uh, by Governor Lamont. Uh, and then uh, another bill of interest, I think, uh, in this realm is a bill related to arts, culture, and tourism. Uh, House Bill 6119. Uh, uh, it renames the Tourism Fund to the Arts, Culture, and Tourism Fund, reflecting the fund's investments uh, more accurately. This bill would increase the percentage of the state's lodging tax set aside for this fund uh, from 10% to 25%. Tourism uh, is an important economic driver for our downtowns. Uh, it has passed out of uh, the Commerce Committee and hopefully it would uh, get adopted. We did uh, support that piece of legislation at Connecticut Main Street Center. Uh, this next uh, bullet, Protect Community Investment Act funds, uh, it's essentially uh, CIA funds are a conveyance fee that goes uh, to fund historic preservation, affordable housing and open space acquisition. Uh, CIA funds have been instrumental in many projects uh, enhancing downtowns uh, over the years. Uh, so we continually uh, monitor that. Uh, sometimes it's a special account and it can get swept into the general fund. Uh, as far as I know, there's no move uh, this year to do that. So uh, Community Investment Act uh, funds will continue to go to uh, the purposes that it was designed for. Uh, for the sense of uh, place, uh, we look to uh, create tools to address abandoned and blighted uh, properties. Uh, there was a bill before the legislature um, uh, to extend the receivership uh, legislation, House Bill 6418. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the General Assembly passed a, a law that allowed uh, uh, nonprofits, municipalities, and other uh, private sector entities to uh, petition to court uh, to be a receiver on an abandoned property to get the building or the property moving in, the, in a, a more positive direction. And uh, it had a minimum community uh, population uh, threshold of 35,000. The bill that uh, was before the legislature, uh, bef uh, before the uh, Planning and Development Committee this year, uh, was to remove that uh, minimum population uh, requirement. Uh, I haven't gotten the uh, full story yet, but uh, it was not voted out of committee. We'll try to get uh, more of an understanding of what the, what the rationale for that was. Uh, we've we've uh, supported 
of that legislation. There's communities uh, that have less than 35,000 in our state that certainly have vacant or underutilized uh, properties that uh, we think additional tools like receivership could be uh, beneficial to. Uh, we have uh, always each year uh, as part of our legislative agenda, Connecticut Main Street uh, is the support of the State Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit that's uh, managed by the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, we always want to see that it's uh, the funding uh, that goes into that program is maintained uh, and or uh, increased if at all possible. It is such an important gap uh, financing tool on, uh, on all those different mill, uh, building conversions that you've seen, the multi-story mixed use buildings in our downtown, uh, critical, critical funding source. Uh, Representative Garibay, I believe mentioned, or uh, Leeper mentioned uh, this legislation uh, that was proposed by Connecticut Main Street Center and uh, was submitted through the Conservation Commi uh, Committee. Uh, to establish a, a multi-agency uh, task force that would include the Department of Economic Com uh, Community Development, uh, Department of Housing, uh, Department of Administrative uh, Services, uh, and the Department of Banking to look at uh, what tools are necessary for us to get more of those uh, multi-story mixed-use buildings moving in the, in the right direction. Uh, there's several all across uh, the state that they take a long time uh, to, uh, to get redeveloped, uh, it needs patient capital and it needs the right people around the, around the table. Uh, I recently heard uh, from, uh, from uh, Tom Rano in uh, Middletown about a three-story structure in their downtown that uh, it just hasn't moved towards redevelopment. So we wanna look at the impediments uh, that are you know, uh, preventing more of these buildings from uh, getting uh, rehabbed. Uh, then uh, the next section is uh, inclusiveness. Uh, we want to support uh, diversity of people, incomes, and uses in our downtowns. At Connecticut Main Street Center, we believe our downtowns are for everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is. We want you to open up businesses. We want you to come down and enjoy walking through the downtowns and the village uh, centers. Uh, it's very important uh, for essentially a sense of uh, community in all of our, uh, in all of our towns. Uh, as you all know, there's been uh, several bills uh, for zoning reform and uh, affordable housing uh, that were uh, submitted this year. Uh, the most well known being the one being supported by Desegregate Connecticut, uh, Senate Bill 1024. Um, the bill included amongst uh, other provisions, uh, as of right development of up to four units per lot on a main street corridor of the town's choosing as well as as of right development of multi-unit uh, housing in proximity to transit hubs. Uh, we did provide written testimony in support of the bill as we believe that additional housing uh, in proximity to our main streets will help our small uh, businesses thrive. Uh, the bill was passed out of uh, committee, uh, but actually the sections on main street and transit in, uh, oriented development were pulled from the bill. Uh, the bill was, uh, also would convene a working group to develop model design guidelines for buildings and context appropriate streets, uh, which could be useful for downtown locations. So uh, communities that don't have uh, the ability to pay for outside design uh, services to, to draft model uh, regulations, that could be a, a, a great tool moving forward for some of the smaller communities. Uh, also the uh, broadband uh, is a big issue. Uh, the governor has submitted a bill uh, to ensure access to broadband technology across the state, as well as to map the broadband uh, network. Uh, it's quite amazing that many of the communities just have no idea uh, the extent of the uh, broadband network in, in, their, in their towns. And so this would uh, require broadband uh, mapping. Uh, broadband is uh, incredibly important to our small businesses, whether it's in a rural, suburban, or urban uh, setting. So uh, please be supportive of those efforts. Uh, on the, in the case of sustainability, uh, we believe downtown investment is green development. A few bills that you should be aware of. Uh, there's one that's protection and preservation of historic properties, House Bill 6547. Uh, it would require the Department of uh, Economic and Community Development to convene a working group to, to develop a plan to support and facilitate historic uh, preservation efforts by municipalities 
historical societies and other nonprofit entities. You may have also heard of uh, this initiative called the Transport, uh, Transportation Climate Initiative, TCIP, uh, that Governor Lamont is proposing partnering with uh, neighboring states uh, to implement a regional uh, program that caps CO2 emissions from gasoline and on-road diesel fuels. It requires wholesale fuel uh, suppliers to purchase allowances at auction to cover the emissions from those fuels. And here's the key part, uh, it reinvests the proceeds of those uh, auctions into transportation projects and programs that will reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Uh, the program could potentially help fund uh, bike ped uh, and transit improvements in our downtowns. Uh, the final bullet here is uh, Brownfields. The good news is uh, the governor's uh, budget does include the funding to continue all of uh, DCD's uh, great Brownfields uh, uh, programs. Connectivity. Uh, it's really important uh, for us that we facilitate walkable connected uh, communities. Uh, this is one of the most important bills uh, for downtowns uh, this year, this legislative session, House Bill 5429 uh, on pedestrian bike uh, safety. Uh, it provides uh, new uh, provisions related to crosswalks. I don't know if it, you know, but you actually actually have to step into the road in order for a car to actually be required to stop. Uh, this legislation would say that if you indicate your desire to cross at a crosswalk, that the vehicle must, uh, must stop. So that's really important. Uh, pedestrian uh, safety zones, uh, very, uh, this is a great uh, initiative here uh, by DOT. It was DOT initiated. Let me repeat that. This was DOT initiated that in uh, downtowns and community centers, uh, the local traffic authority can do a traffic study, and if they felt it uh, wise, they could uh, get the vehicle speed reduced to uh, a minimum of 15 miles per hour. Uh, so that could be really critical in a lot of our downtowns uh, to reduce the speed. Some, you know, it, there, many are state routes going through at 30 miles an hour. If we could get them reduced to 25 or, or 20. Uh, pedestrians will feel safer uh, circulating around the downtowns. And if they do potentially get, uh, get hit, it, it, they won't have as uh, life-threatening uh, injuries, hopefully. Uh, we're also uh, looking at uh, bills that incentivize transit-oriented development. Uh, there's a bill to uh, expand the number of trains and services on the uh, Waterbury branch line, as well as um, to do a study of rail in Eastern Connecticut, uh, looking at potentially new stops in uh, Groton as well as uh, Stonington. Uh, those train stations and the rapid uh, bus transit and uh, along the fast track, just critical uh, to adding vibrancy and life to the downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts. So we hope everybody will uh, support continued investments in, in uh, TOD and, and transit. Uh, finally, uh, on stewardship, uh, we want to support managed downtowns. We really appreciate the support of the Main Street Working Group on this. Uh, we are requesting a $350,000 state budget line item for Connecticut Main Street Center. Uh, as I mentioned at, at the top of uh, this uh, presentation, DCD has been a longtime uh, financial uh, supporter of Connecticut Main Street Center. We're looking to increase the state um, participation in, in our program uh, so that we can build uh, staff capacity and uh, serve more of the communities. We'd like to bring on board a field services uh, specialist and uh, potentially another uh, person to help with uh, fund development. So we, we hope that uh, people on this uh, on the Zoom who like the work that we uh, that we do. Uh, that you've uh, benefited from the technical assistance that we provided uh, in your downtowns. Uh, please consider reaching out to your local legislators. Uh, consider writing a letter of support to Speaker Ritter, uh, to the chairs of the appropriate and the ranking members of the Appropriations uh, Committee, as well as the uh, chairs and ranking members of a subcommittee on conservation and development, uh, subcommittee of appropriations. 
we, we do have template uh, language uh, relative to that. And so if anybody would be willing to put in a good word for us, please reach out to me so that we can, uh, can move that uh, forward. And uh, with that, I'm gonna stop the share and we're gonna talk about advocacy just in, uh, just in general. So representatives, how do you like to be uh, uh, contacted by your constituents? What's, what's the best means? I love a phone call. I mean, it can be through email, you know, out when you're visiting the grocery store, although that's harder. But I love a phone call where we can actually chat um, and communicate back and forth about what's of interest to them. I'll add, uh, email's always a great way to reach us and then we can set up a phone call. You can also um, call or text anytime. I, I will second what Rep Garibay said that sometimes a text actually breaks through <laughs> the many, many emails we get to uh, right. expedite, expedite the concern. So I will put both of those here in the chat for you. Great, how about you, uh, Representative Phipps, any suggestions on best ways to contact? Yes, I will just share exactly what they said. Um, definitely, I mean, email always works, but I know I always prefer um, to give me a call or text message. Um, I know many of us and many legislators have their direct cell phone number um, either on their website um, or on any of their social media pages. So a call or text is always um, welcome. Uh, what types of issues or concerns should people bring to legislators' attention? And what are some of the types of uh, questions and concerns you deal with on a regular basis? One of the things that, and I see um, a question here in the chat is about funding streams for specific types of projects. And Patrick, I think it was just the last session that you hosted was specifically about all of the financial instruments that are actually available to communities to help facilitate all sorts of types of Main Street um, and transit oriented projects. And I know one of the things I often hear about are sidewalk projects and um, creating more walkable neighborhoods to access our main street. And uh, that's one of the things I hear about frequently. And I think it's important for us to work together. You know, what the state legislator can bring to the table is different than what the town manager can bring to the table to the executive director of your main street and different. So working together just gives us a lot more force and information working together. And there's two parts that I always say. Um, so one, if there, you have um, need help with any of the departments, right? Um, Department of Labor, you have an issue with energy, with housing, um, oftentimes your state legislative office will be able to help. So I would always encourage you to send an email if you're having, a tr if you're having trouble. And you should always reach out if you ever think or say out loud, I hate when, or this if this is the law and what the law should be, should be this, right? If that ever comes to mind, reach out to your legislator because um, many of the best policy and ideas come from someone saying, I had a conversation with my constituent, I had a conversation with a stakeholder, I had a conversation with someone in the grocery store at a restaurant, and now I'm proposing this law and it's gotten all the way to the finish line. So if you ever think, I wish this was this way or this sucks, I want it to be this, Start immediately texting. But make sure you have a solution, though. Thank you, Representative Phipps. We, we often hear about uh, funding uh, requirements, so thanks for pointing that out. Uh, Representative Leeper, one of the, the chat uh, items was on something called the Main Street Investment Fund uh, that uh, Connecticut Main Street Center years ago worked with uh, OPM on uh, kind of establishing the criteria for that program. It ended up uh, getting uh, switched over to the Department of Housing and what that fund could, uh, could be utilized on was some storefront type of uh, investments, uh, facades and other treatments that could really improve the, the downtowns. Um, it has uh, not been funded uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I did mention that on uh, that uh, educational program uh, that uh, we did just uh, last month. And we'll continue to reach out to the Department of Housing and see what the, the latest is on that program and maybe bring it back uh, as an item of discussion for next legislative uh, session. 
Um, we want to hear from you. What are the what are those funding programs that are absolutely critical for the work that you're doing downtowns? Um, what's the best way to track all of these bills? It, it seems like uh, there's some art and science to it. Uh, what what tips do you have? Somebody figures it out. You can let me know. <laughs> I was going to say we're still figuring it out, Patrick. <laughs> I, I, having worked for a state agency, I always joked that if um, it is available on the website, it's in fact clandestine. And, <laughs> and I sometimes feel that way about these bills too. Um, we should have a cheat sheet about how to effectively navigate the website, honestly, and how to search for a bill. And then on that page, which language is like the most up-to-date language? I think that could be a real value add for for 99.9% .9 of, of people. Um, and definitely use your, your, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, please go. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you can always contact us um, and we can muddle through it and get you the um, bill language also. So I appreciate our tri-chair and co-chairs um, candor because once again it's a it's a it's a tough process and i will say that um even with fairly experienced legislators our whole two terms in or first term in um it's difficult it really is difficult to, to keep track of the numerous policies that are put and build it up through i mean on the house alone i think it was six thousand five hundred plus right so how do you track six thousand five hundred plus the, the first the fact of the matter is you can't right um so things you can do one use a cga website um if you know the bill number um, you can always just search it at the bottom of the website, and then it will also say all the bills that are similar to that. So that's one way to follow. Um, two, and this is, I think, um, probably the, the the real trick of the trade, is that you have to use stakeholders like CCM, CT Main Street, um, and other um, coalitions to be able to track this work. There's no way to do it by yourself. Um, you do need expertise. You do need experts. And to be frank, you do need uh, people whose job it is to follow these bills. And there's a, a daily bulletin, wanna mention? Oh yeah. The daily bulletin is a really helpful tool. Um, and you know, I'll add one thing to what Rep Phipps said is that you could leverage your state legislator because we have access to track bills and get um, updates as bills work through the process, which is really, really helpful. It can be challenging for us if you are trying to track say 70 bills, but um, if you know one and you want help tracking it explicitly, you can ask your state rep to help you with that. And, and we get reports on uh, as bills are updated through the process. What, uh, what tips would you have for both written and oral testimony? I think it's very important. I've seen bills that do seem to have a, um, a chance getting out of committee actually people testifying, sending in your written um, testimony and then testifying, changing the way that vote came down and it just happened to one of ours um, and human services. So testimony is important. Not everyone, it's easier through Zoom to testify, but even if you just submit written testimony, that's important. And when you can to physically, um, you know, make that testimony, it can change minds. I'll add to include your state rep on whatever testimony you submit, because if they're not in that committee, they might not otherwise be aware. And it's really helpful. As Rep. Phipps said, with 6,500 bills, we don't always know everything that's going on if we're not on that committee. And I've had several um, constituents include me on all of the testimony they submit, and it's really, really valuable. And I will also say, um, submit your testimony and then speak from the heart, right? So your testimony is probably should include uh, data points, metric, um, any of the sort of scientific stuff. Uh, when you testify, please don't read. We can all, we, everyone can always read it themselves. Um, but just share your story and how it personally affects you or affects your constituents or those you represent. Um, we're supposed to speak to your story. I said, it, it's, you, folks can always argue and disagree with data or a number of metrics and how it's interpreted or where it came from, so on and so forth. We can't argue with your story. We can't argue with your experience. So share that and speak from the heart um, and tell your truth. And, and on the back of that, I'd add, if you, if you get um, template 
testimony, give it a personal spin so that it really forces us to read your specific testimony and not just assume, oh, okay, it's another one of the batch of this type of testimony. I think that's really valuable that you add your own personal touch. Right, because we can get 100 to 200 emails a day and when they're just the standard coming through and we get them from people that aren't our constituents that you might not normally answer, but when someone's telling me their story and speaking from, you know, their experience, I answer whether they're in my district or not. It's like, well, thank you. Um, because you might get 30 of the other, just all the same. So Jen. Those are some great tips. And uh, thank you so much, uh, representatives Phipps, Scarabay and uh, Leeper for first launching and leading the Main Street Working Group. It's a, a great new a, a addition uh, for advocacy all across the state for our downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts. And uh, for your participation today, you gave some great, uh, great insights. Uh, once again, uh, a recording of today's session will be available on our website, ctmainstreet.org, where you can find a great deal of information no matter what stage of revitalization you're in. For instance, you can access our Reopen Downtown video series produced by Arnett and Muldrow. These are short videos that can be watched anytime and shared with your local businesses. Topics include how to establish e-commerce presence, social media for small businesses, and Main Street programs, tips for health and beauty businesses, and effective retail photography. Our next webinar, Vacant Property Strategies, Turning the Lights Back On, is scheduled for Tuesday, May 11th at 10 a.m. Vacant properties are often functionally obsolete and you need the right tools to fix the problem. In this session, we're pleased to have Donald Poland, uh, Managing Director of Planning and Strategy at Goman and York, uh, examine the complex reasons why properties uh, are unused, the critical importance of market alignment, and expanding the toolbox to reach your dreams and visions. Tools considered include master plans, zoning and code correction, parking strategies, and historic preservation tools to bring vacant buildings back to life in your community. Join Main Street America on April 12th to 14th next week uh, for the virtual Main Street Now Conference, the premier gathering of local leaders from across the country and the world who share a commitment to build vibrancy and economic opportunity in downtowns and commercial districts. Howard Schultz, the former CEO and Chairman Emeritus of the Starbucks Coffee Company, will be the keynote speaker at the opening plenary. Looking forward to uh, hearing that. Local elected officials, uh, this is important. Uh, there is, uh, and senior level local government staff are encouraged to attend at a discounted uh, rate of $50. Uh, there will also be a small business day on Tuesday, April 13th, the first ever uh, at a Main Street uh, Now conference where you can encourage your small businesses in your downtowns uh, to sign up for this conference for $25 uh, at a discounted rate. And anybody who registers for this uh, conference, the uh, sessions will be available uh, to be viewed uh, over the course of the next year. Uh, so you would have access to all of the sessions uh, from, from the conference. And with that, we thank you for attending today. Please help us uh, by completing the evaluation you will receive shortly in your inbox. And we'd love for you to join us on social media. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Take care of yourselves and have a great day. Thanks everyone.